ago the privilege of, of making the acquaintance of Dr. Joseph B. Mahan, uh, who is the president of, of the organization shortened in terms of, to ISIC, that's the Institute for Study of Ancient American Cultures. Dr. Mahan has uh, written a book. Uh, the title of the book is The Secret. And uh, Believe me, you have to read it three or four times before you actually realize what the secret is that he's talking about. We'll get to that. Uh, Dr. Mahan also was responsible for my meeting the uh, biblical archaeologist who is here tonight, I believe, uh, Jackson Judge. Where are you? Uh, up here in the corner. This Jackson Judge up in the corner, folks. Stand up there, Jackson. Leave that pretty girl be for a minute. Thank you. Uh, Jackson and I have worked quite a bit together over the past, what, Jackson, three or four years? Yeah, three years. Yeah, something like that, okay. And uh, he is very much interested in this cave and, and what's in it. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to kind of get to that right now. Uh, Dr. Mahan. In, in his book, The Secret, uh, talks a lot about the Yuchi Indian tribe. I believe there's a gentleman here uh, with Kathy, I think, uh, who's Cherokee, or where, where did he go? Where did your friend go? Uh, I, mean, I don't see him now. Okay, I think he's, there he is. Uh, so you're probably familiar with the Yuchi. Uh, <laughs> The the uh, Uchi, the Uchi <coughs> tribe. Are you familiar with them at all? No. Okay. Uh, well, they uh, they came from in this country. They came from the, the down south. They came came into this country into Florida and then on up to Georgia, Alabama, in that area. And were finally in the 1830s moved on to Oklahoma, along with the Cherokees and such as that. Uh, I've got to, so that you understand what I'm talking about, I, I have to do this this way, and I'm probably going to confuse you, but I'm, but I'm not really trying to, but I think eventually everything will become clear as mud. Uh, the basic information which, which was provided by, uh, or for the Uchis was provided by Chief Samuel Brown, who died a few years ago. Uh, he was the chief of the uh, of the Uchis. Uh, he was their, their he, big chief. He had, wore all the lots of feathers and stuff, you know. This is what he said about the Uchi. Their original name was Zoyaha Weno, which was the governing word and is of, as of today, from their starting point. They were also called the Ustapa Weno, up or upper people, or first people. The element Weno in these words means people and Zoya is sun-filled. The symbol Ha is a first-person uh, nominative ending in identifying the speaker as belonging to the people named. Thus the name Zoya properly has, probably has the ending Ha only when it is spoken by a Yuchi Zoya descendant. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what we have in this cave over in southern Illinois is the remains of the ancient sun kings. There's no question about that now. We know who they are. The question of how they got there is something else again, until you think about it. You know, the, uh, the rivers used to be the interstate highways uh, of, of this country. And uh, 
I want to give you a little scenario for putting for putting this this particular thing in Southern Illinois. Uh, Russ, could you speak up for a slight little throat? Oh, okay. Know that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you consider the the waterways, the we have the Mississippi River north. I'm I'm talking. I'm putting you into the, the area of where this cave is. All right. Uh, you have the Mississippi River north to the Ohio River, to the Wabash River, to the Little Wabash River, to Skillet Fork. And at a certain place on the banks of Skillet Fork, you're within a quarter mile of this cave. So you have a direct waterway there. Now, the question is, how did these people get, how did they get here? Uh, I mean, 7th century BC, well, my goodness, everyone, everyone knows that there, there were no seafaring people. Uh, how could they get from Africa or somewhere to the United States? That's what a lot of people will tell you. That's not so. Uh, there was uh, people called the Phoenicians. I want to tell you what, the Phoenicians had some big ships. Their biremes and their triremes were very large ships. Uh, the Byring, which was the smaller of the two, it was a two, two bank, they had two banks of oars on each side, required somewhere in the area of 150 to 160 people to row it. That's how big they were. Now, if you also consider the tides and, and the winds out of the Mediterranean into the Atlantic, South Atlantic, and into the Gulf of Mexico, if I'm not mistaken, the, the currents coming out of of the Mediterranean are in figure eight. Uh, so simply by following the northern route, these people would have come into the Gulf of Mexico and consequently into the mouth of the Mississippi River. Back at this period of time, of course, the Mississippi ran by the place now called Poverty Point. And at Poverty Point, Louisiana, there is residue left yet from uh, from stockpiles of, of native ore, uh, copper, which had been transported down the Mississippi River from somewhere. Uh, what they were doing, of course, is transporting the ore, this ore, back into Egypt or wherever, uh, and uh, they're making bronze. This was the purpose of it. Uh, they, they were here to make bronze, uh, to trade and get this, this metal. But something happened. Nobody knows why, nobody knows what, I should say. These people all at once didn't want to go home. I mean, here they are in, in the land that they call uh, Shemal, uh, or the Northland. They don't want to go home. And so some catastrophe happened down there and they didn't go home. They dispersed, went out, went into other places with other tribes of Native Americans, and, and that was the end of it. They were here for one purpose, I believe, other than the picking up of ore, the, the, the garnering of the copper ore, and that was to, to provide for the burial place of their, of their, their religious leaders, the, the ancient sun kings, or the Zoya. Um, Peculiar thing is that cave was sealed from the inside. Uh, so what happened? What happened to these to the people? No one, no one knows. I do know this. I know there are human remains in the cave. I've seen them. Uh, but how did I find it? Well, that that's kind of an interesting story, I guess. Uh, I fell in a hole. You know, I wasn't watching what I was doing, and I fell in a hole. <laughs> I'm lucky I'm here, because if I hadn't been turning, in the process of turning around, I would have been in a 12-foot deep pit with a 225-pound stone 12 feet above me. There's no way that I would have gotten out. But fortunately for me, I was turning, the stone pushed to the edge, I went down, I bounced back up, and something caught my attention, though, while I was down there. I, I want to tell you, I don't recall hitting bottom that first time. I have no really, the next thing I know I'm up on the edge of that, that thing. 
you know, scared to death. I thought, my God, I'm knee deep in snakes, and I hate snakes. And uh, in Indiana, and I have a common I hate snakes too. <laughs> I'm Illinois, okay? Uh, but something, something went click. I, I had seen something. I'm a trained observer, okay? So I, I knew that I had seen something down there that I shouldn't have seen. And I dropped back down. I mean, it hadn't been snake bit yet, so okay, there's no snakes in there. I found myself nose to nose and eye to eye with, with a very large face carved in this wall of this pit, which is about four feet wide and 12 feet up, you know. That face was watching was then and still is watching a doorway which is is sealed with cut and fitted stones I mean they're fitted so tightly that you can't get a knife blade between them okay. now this takes me this takes me again to the uh, new book that Dr. Mahan is writing, and that is uh, the Zoya North American Sun Kings, which I just read to you a moment ago. In this thing, and I should have marked it, and I didn't, I have no idea where it's at. Well, Chief Brown told Dr. Mahan before he died that the, the burial place of the ancient Sun Kings would be found in middle or Midwest United States. He didn't know where it was. No one did. It would be found in the Midwest. He also said that there would be a sentinel guarding it, which there is. I was, I don't know. I was rubbing his nose. You know, <laughs> he was there. Uh, all of the evidence which which I which has been compiled and which has been presented to people like Dr. Mahan, Professor Cyclone Covey down at uh, Wake Forest, and a couple of fellows up at uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, pretty well tells us who these people are. The interesting thing about them is is that sentinel, that guard, that fellow that's guarding this place. Uh, I, I have no, I have no doubt, whatever, that, that that there is a spirit connected with that particular thing. I'll tell you this also: there are spirits in that cave. You know, there is a lot of spirits in that cave. I know because I've heard them. <laughs> I've felt them. Uh, why are they there? I mean, are they? This is, a, this is not a question I can answer. I mean, I, maybe someone will have an idea. Why are they there? Are they still protecting? I mean, after, after you know, a couple of thousand years, are, are, they, are they still protecting their, their, their sun kings? Who knows? Someday maybe we'll find out. But uh, I, I don't really know. All I know is that I, I came very close one night to uh, creating a new exit or entrance. That was the night I <laughs> that was the night I opened the uh, one of the burial crypts. I did not disturb anything, and I opened it, stuck my head in, and this woman gave me a great big smack, and I heard this voice in here. I won't say I heard it here. I heard it. I don't know whether I heard it or I heard it. I say, where have you been for so long? Now, I want to tell you, folks, I turned around. <laughs> I turned around in a place that I couldn't hardly get through. I mean, I turned around all the way, you know, and, and I'm thinking, I wonder, do we want a new exit right here? You know, I was thinking about it, I want to tell you. And then I realized, no, wait a minute here. What, what's going on with this? And, and then some other things that had happened came back to me, the spirits that I had heard in there. First time I had heard them uh, was one night, oh, probably two or three o'clock, and I was very tired. Uh, and I thought, well, I'll take a little nap. You know, it's always dark in a cave. So I turned off my light, put my head down, and I wasn't long before I began to hear this rustling sound. 
Now that wasn't too strange because there, there is a breeze that blows, blows through this cave most of the time. But this rustling sound began to get a little louder and louder and louder and then I was able, I realized then that this is voices that I was hearing. And I thought, oh boy, I've been followed. Someone has for sure found it. So I turned on my light and zipped it around and there's nobody there, the noise stopped. Well, I'm dreaming, I'm tired. I mean, I've been in this place every night now for a month, you know, and I, so I turned the light off and they're instantly back, but this time very close. Close enough, as a matter of fact, to touch me. I actually felt them touch me. So, the next thing, uh, with, what was my the training and such that I've had with, with in, in working with, uh, with the spirit world and the occult, whatever you want to call it, I realized then and there that I was going to have to make peace with these spirits. Uh, and I was very fortunate in that I was able to do that. And the fact also is, that I, is evident that I did do it is that I'm still alive and here. Well, I'm quite certain that if, if I had not, if I had not done that, those spirits would have killed me. I would not be here. As a matter of fact, these, I believe that these spirits protect me everywhere I go. I have no idea why. I, I have been told by people who should know that I was probably selected for some reason to be the one to find this cave. Well, I, I have a hard time with that. I mean, I was a fool that fell into a pit. And then after that, I didn't have enough sense to keep my mouth shut about it, which is what I should have done, really. Kept my mouth shut. I wouldn't have been called a fraud and a few other things like that. Uh, so, the fact, the fact remains, though, that, that, that we do have or my beloved ghosties, as I call them. I've always called them that ever since I got tangled up with the things back when I was 14, 12, 14 years ago. And that's only been eight or nine years that way. But, you know, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I, I'm not lying, really. You know. <coughs> but uh, the important thing is that I was able to make peace with them. And, and from that point on, they helped me. They, they've actually been very helpful uh, in, in working in this cave. Now, what, what did I find in there? Well, I want to talk about the burials just a little. Uh, I'm sure you're probably all getting, getting tired of hearing about dead people by now, so let's, we'll talk about burials just a little bit. These, the burial crypts in this, in this cave are uh, about 12 feet deep, probably eight feet wide, and possibly seven to eight feet high. They are cut out of solid stone and back into the walls of this cave. And this cave, by the way, is a limestone cavern. It's not a cave, it's a cavern. Uh, I, and my deepest penetration so far, by the way, is a little over 500 feet, and I'm nowhere near the end of it yet. But uh, these, uh, the, the first the first of the burial crypts that I looked into was, was, was where I obtained the, the basic uh, description of it. Uh, 12 feet by 8 feet by, well, 7, 8 feet, something like that. The, uh, on the northern, northern wall of, of the burial crypt is a, a beer, a stone beer. When, when this thing was cut, uh, that beer was left, and the body was laid on it. Now, I'm quite certain that uh, that the thing was prepared before this pre these people died, because uh, I think it would have taken these people a long time to to remove that much stone. Uh, in the first one I looked in, uh, is holds a, a man. Uh, and he was put away in grand style. Uh, he was wearing copper, uh, pounded copper, and uh, <laughs> other metal. How's that, Jackson? He's wearing other metal and copper. 
Uh, there are many things in that burial crypt that, that, tell, that tell us that this was a pretty, pretty big guy. Uh, bronze weapons, axe, there's, a, there's bronze axe lying by his, I believe, if I remember, his right side. Standing in the corner is a set of bronze spears. The first one, well, the biggest, is about six feet long. I think the next one's about three and a half, four feet, and then the smaller one, about 28. These are bronze. American Indians and Native Americans did not use bronze. Um, there are also jars uh, buried with, with this man. These jars are Coptic in style. Uh, there are small ones, there are big ones, and there are middle-sized ones, and there's one that has a whole bunch of scrolls in it, which I didn't touch. Well, I know they would fall apart if I did. Uh, next door to this man is uh, a woman and two children buried there. Uh, I am sure that they were related to this man, probably his wife and children, because they were sacrificed. The woman had a spear point, a metal spear point embedded through a rib into the area of the heart which would have, I'm sure, would have produced an instantaneous death. The children were not so fortunate. They were clubbed to death. They were, their skulls were fractured and punctured. There is laying on the pier with them a marble ax, pure white marble, which fits these punctures in their skulls identically, exactly. So this, this was the weapon that killed the two children. But why? I mean, why were they killed? Okay, so maybe the woman's husband died. Well, my theory is this. She's the wife of a Zoyama, or a sun king. There's no way that a commoner could do anything for her in their belief, in their religion. He couldn't, he couldn't do anything for her. She's too far above him. She doesn't even see him. So, so she was sacrificed. Uh, whether this is actual, actually what happened or not, I don't know, but it's possible, especially from some of the things that I have read about the way these things were done, because these people were very, very religious in their own particular way. Uh, we have had, as some of you have probably heard, we've had a lot of trouble with this, with this thing. Uh, oh, and by the way, before I forget, I told you about the the two burials in there. There, there are uh, a total of 13 burial crypts that I know of in the cave. Now, three only have been opened, uh, and uh, they have not they've not been desecrated or damaged in any way. I was very careful that I didn't do that. Plus, I made sure I had my shaman's approval to go ahead and do it. So, but he told me, uh, the shaman that I spoke to and who controls what I do spiritually, uh, but I, I have some Indian blood too. I belong to a lot of med medicine laws with the Algonquin Nation. I won't tell you which tribe or anything. But, uh, oh, okay. How's that better? I'm I'm getting tired, so I get weak when I get tired. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I am uh, I am a member of a medicine lodge, uh, an Algonquin medicine lodge. As a matter of fact, I am a shaman uh, with this particular lodge, and uh, I have talked to my satchel about this cave prior to, and he said, well. I, I know what the cave is after your description. He said that we're not concerned about it because these people are not Native Americans. So he said, you go ahead and do whatever you want to do. <laughs> They're not ours. I said, fine, who are they? And uh, he told me that they were the men from the East. Uh, I asked him, what do you mean the men from the East? And of course he went into a big hoorah about uh, how ancient people had traveled to the North American continent years ago. 
but he gave me his blessing and I went ahead and did it and had a lot of fun. Uh, the last burial crypt that I looked into is actually is at my furthest point of penetration into the cave. And uh, it, uh, it was sealed or closed a little differently than, than the other one. Uh, this one has a very large round disc uh, or stone, a stone disc cut off of the wall, which when the final cut was made behind it, dropped into a trough, rolled down and closed off this tomb. Sounds familiar? Kind of like the, the uh, kind of like the Christian's method of closing a tomb. Though I have found nothing the Christian in this so far. Uh, I used a couple of come-alongs and a few other things and managed to get this very large stone rolled back and went in there. And right in the middle of this room, boy, here's this big stone box. I uh, thought, treasure, you know. And I opened it, and sure enough, treasure. There's, there's a casket in there, made of metal. Uh, and there is what appears to be the remains of a mummy in this, in this particular coffin. I took a peep in there. And here I am, boy, I'm feeling around in all this rotting, decaying materials cloth, and I, I just feel the death mass. And all at once it hit me. My God, that's curse. Instantly get my hands out, back out of there, thinking, have I breathed any of the spores which killed all those people, which was, which caused the, the King Tut's curse, you know, that it wasn't a curse, actually, it was a spore or some kind of a germ that these people breathed that was, that came from the uh, wrappings and, and the uh, embalming fluid that they used on him, and it, 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 it didn't take very long. Once this, this spore got into the, into the respiratory system, these people were dead very shortly thereafter. Well, fortunately for me, it didn't. Uh, and I, I've been back in that one a couple of times, uh, just kind of checking what is there. That, that is a fantastic bird. I mean, it is fantastic. And when the archaeologists and anthropologists and paleontologists and whoever else goes in there and sees that, they're going to shriek and scream and do everything else, but old Russ is going to be gone because when they get in there, I'm going to go find me another cave. You know, someone else can worry about this one then. I, I know where there's some more I want to look at. Describe uh, more detail about the Oh yeah, there there are this particular this particular burial vault is lined with with uh, slabs of pure white marble. Uh, one of these has been tested by a petrologist at the Field Museum in Chicago, and he stated that uh, in his written statement he said that this is a white material. The white material is a finely crystalline marble not found in Illinois or adjacent states. So where did it come from? Well, I know what I know what the marble that comes out of Arkansas and up in uh, up in New England looks like. It's got those dark streaks to it and flaws. You know those are flaws. There's none in this. It's pure white and the crystals are extremely fine. Uh, there's only one place that comes from. It comes from the Mediterranean. So, the question is: Did these people, did these, did these people actually come from Egypt or Africa or Tibet, somewhere like that? And if they did, did they bring a whole shipload of rocks with them? I mean, it doesn't sound plausible, does it? But really, if you think about it, why, why in the name of gosh would they want people to, to why, why would they load a load a ship full of rocks and row the river, the, the thing across the ocean to here. Ballast. That's right. That's exactly what it was. It was ballast. Uh, when they got here, then they used it for something else. Uh, because each and every one of these stone, or these marble slabs, has a portrait carved into it. 
in the bas relief, classic Egyptian relief. Though the characters on these on these slabs are not necessarily Egyptian, uh, they some appear to be Egyptian, some do not. Theory now coming out of the University of Wisconsin is that these people were actually uh, Tibetan. And if that proves to be so, then it goes right back, it has turned its complete circle back to the secret. Because the Yuchi's history teaches, tells them that they came from Tibet. They came to the, to the North American continent by way of the islands, came into Florida, settled in there, and later on up into Georgia and, and Alabama. So we've, we've made a complete circle with it there. Uh, the answer is there. I don't have the answer. Uh, in all probability, the answer will not be realized in my lifetime. But we're looking at a tremendous, a tremendous excavation. We're looking at, right now, better than 500 feet in length, uh, 8 to 12 feet in depth, anywhere from from three to sixty or seventy feet in width, that every single little scoop of it has got to be screened, screened, and studied. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I had a couple questions for you. Uh, you said you ran into some problems. No, I, I take it you've already shown this to several other people, or are you keeping this mostly to yourself? And secondly, so you found this, you have any problems with where you found it? So federal land, state land, private land, or a place that you might have problems with that? Okay. Uh Prior to uh, prior to January 1 of 1990, uh, Title V only applied in the state of Illinois, and that was uh, state uh, state or federal property. Uh, this, however, is on private property, uh, so there's no problem there. Uh, there is now a problem. Uh, it's right now in the state of Illinois. It's illegal. I, I'm violating the law if I go in the cave now. It's, it's, it's a proven burial site. The state, the new state law says you go in, you violate it, you're going to pay the price. And it's, it's, it's very salty. I mean, it's a very <coughs> stiff penalty to have to pay. A uh, person is just like going to jail for a long, long time. Uh, as to the other trouble, here we go. That's the other trouble stems from from one group. Is anyone here a member of the Epigraphic Society? No? No members of the Epigraphic Society here? <coughs> okay. The Epigraphic Society is an organization which has, which claims to be the, the experts in decipherment of the ancient scripts uh, and open languages. Doesn't matter what language is written in. You know, they can decipher it. So long as Dr. Barry Fell uh, says he can decipher it. That's where our other trouble came in. Uh, See, Barry Fell is very protective of his copyrights, and uh, he he claims that that this uh, uh, that some of these artifacts, photographs of these artifacts uh, which he has seen, were in fact copies of his copyrighted material, and so we have had a big hoopla with that now for nine years. Nine years, the Epigraphic Society has tried to prove that, that this cave is fraudulent. They have actually used the term fraudulent. Uh, for nine years, they've tried to do this. For nine years, they have failed. This year, at, at the Isaac Conference in Columbus, Georgia, uh, uh, 
the epigraphic society is going to finally get their comeuppance. We're going to let them have both barrels. Uh, that's the basic trouble we've had. Now, you wouldn't think that one, one guy, one, one man, could cause so much trouble as to, to cause a delay in this excavation getting started for five or six years. He actually has done that. He has prevented the excavation from being started for that period of time. The reason he wants to do it, I'm, I'm being very blunt here, I don't like the guy. You know, <laughs> uh, he knows that we are going to prove that he is wrong. Plain and simple. He's going to be proven that he is, he's going to be proven wrong when this, when this excavation starts. When that happens, the epigraphic society is out of business. Barry Bell is in fact going to be proven to be a fraud himself. Because I, I know myself of, if someone ever hand up? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just curious, how, how has he specifically uh, stopped the uh, investigation of crimes? What, what has he done? Well, archaeologists and, and anthropologists are, are very jealous of their reputations. Uh, they have, and, and rightly so, they have to be very careful of what they do. Uh, because a little stigma attached to an, arch an archaeologist or an anthropologist, and, and, and it's going to take him a long time to live it down. So, Barry Bell says it's fraud. Okay, uh, Joe Blow, the archaeologist over here, says Oh gee, I was going to excavate that, but now I don't know. I might, I might get smeared. You know, I might, someone might not think I, I, you know, might not think very well of me if I do this. So he doesn't. I hope you're not an archaeologist. <laughs> uh, so he doesn't do it. So you can't find an archaeologist to do the job. That almost doesn't make sense because if you have all this proof and all these chambers out there, it would just take several witnesses to go down and look. Answer it, Jackson. I see you want to. I was going to say, take the handful of That's already been done. And uh, what I say to a lot of people, a lot of time, is once you just talk to the witnesses that are so interested in going there, why would you not believe their story? And why would you think somebody's going to believe yours? Another thing is the site is priceless. It's absolutely priceless. And not even for 10 or 20 or 30,000 dollars if I even ever consider it. Anyone going there? Why risk the site for one for somebody's just word of mouth? You know, Russell Burroughs is, is our witness, and he is the one who's brought us back the artifacts. And as an archaeologist, I have given the stuff my authenticity without ever having to go there. And are doing them over the course of two years and looking at the detail of the artifacts. And you're you're doing a very well. He hasn't done this all on his own. I mean, we should have the state archaeologists sitting here with us right now. Okay, where are they? Where's the archaeologist for the state of Illinois? Where's the Smithsonian Institution? Where's National Geographic? Okay, there's no way that Russ Burroughs could be expected to be a multi-million dollar institution on his own. He is about to change the world history to us. The word of five witnesses. I really don't think it would do us any good. It would risk the site. If you would have 10 footprints leading right to the entrance. That's it. Are you the only man that knows where this is? I don't understand exactly what the situation is yet, Well, the. Is there anyone else on there besides you? There, there have been, there have been, uh, been six people to the cave. And these people are, are, are all sworn, the other five are all sworn to secrecy on the pain of death by me. <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> they, they tried. Yeah. If the state archaeologists in Illinois or anyone else, they got a hold of this, we would have never heard about it. They would blow up the other people too. We would never heard about it. But why? Why would they have because if I'm a preacher, for 40 years I've preached to one doctor and someone comes yeah. along with hard evidence and says you're wrong, they are not about to give Russ Burroughs money to go out to the field and prove exactly. that for him to prove them wrong. They're going to do everything in their power to say 
under wraps to raise any kind of suspicion about it, and uh, anything they can to drag it out and make it look bad, they would do. And he's been through a lot more than what he's done. I guess I should ask an obvious question. Have you brought out pictures, videotape, any of this kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some photographs. After I finally was <laughs> got smart and asked, after exposing roll upon roll of film, uh, after I finally got got smart and asked the spirits to allow me to photograph, then I was able to get eight photographs inside the cave. Yeah. Uh, answering your question, though, uh, up here, sir. Uh, if uh, what was your question? <laughs> no, I, was, I was kind of wondering if you know, this person you just kind of discredit this person and instantly this person would be discredited if these other people would say this exists. You know, like, maybe, like you're saying, this would be trampled on and people were destroyed. Or I, I understand the theory behind behind conspiracy to uh, keep us in a belief system. You know, we have a belief system established for you know, two thousand years. We have a belief system that we want in our uh, society. Then something happened to him. Uh, he, something happened, and, and things changed, and he changed, and he went from from the scholar to something else. Uh, now, you know, I, I have to. As a matter of fact, the last time I spoke to him, I asked him point blank if it is, is indeed very uncomfortable getting down off his cross every morning and getting back on it at night. I mean, uh, you know, are you God? You say yeah. <laughs> This is exactly the way the thing works. Uh, one guy says something, and, and I tell you what, it mushrooms. Uh, no one, no one, until the archaeologists turned the first bit of soil in the cave on May or on April 2nd, 1992, and that is the starting day, firm. Uh, no one will go there. You know, I haven't been there myself now for over a year. This young gentleman here. I was just, just going to ask you, when is this going to be going oh, to to be resolved, where you can prove that and prove yourself? Well, fortunately, that has been proven. Uh, uh, we, we, we no longer really have to worry about the epigraphic society. Uh, uh, we were fortunately, fortunately, I, I was, I was put in contact with this gentleman here, Joseph Mayan, who in turn brought the other people of Isaac into it. Uh, they have been to Vincennes, some of them. They have seen. They have seen artifacts. And uh, these artifacts cannot be questioned. It's just impossible to question. When you look at them, you know. So little by little, Barry Fell and his crowd have been pushed into the background. And we're going to keep them there. Because I know of several other stones, several other sites that were that were poo-pooed by Barry Fell and went by the wayside. One of them was a very excellent find down in Kentucky. Uh, he sent some of his people out and they took a look at it and said, oh no, this can't be real. But I've seen that site myself and it is real. But it's now pronounced wrong. Um, who will get custody of the scrolls when they're putting down the, the uh, Don't look at me. <laughs> I mean, who, who legally will 
have custody of him? Legally? Me. Where are they going to permit? Me. What do you intend to do with him? I wish you hadn't asked that because I don't have an answer for it. I, I will put them somewhere. You see, everything in the cave, the cave itself, everything in it belongs to me. Now, it has been deeded to me. Okay, the cave to the, its furthest reaches now belongs to me. I don't know who I'm going to give it to. Uh, I, I really don't know. One thing's sure, I'm not going to get into the epigraphic society. Good. <laughs> about a hundred hams go up out there. Right? They'll, they'll all take it if you want to get it. Who know. wants them? <laughs> you might, uh, we're going to have to break because they're going to run us out of here. And if we don't get out of here, they're going to rifle us. Yes. Question. You did find out. Yes. The reason I asked that was you said all of the car was stolen. I don't think the car was stolen. <clears throat> I have to be a blacksmith, so I have to. Yeah. Um, so there was iron, so you think that's how they had the ability to do this. In, in, in 30 seconds or less, how much wealth exists within the cave? In, in, you mean in monetary value? Just straight monetary value, not historical value. American Express value. American <laughs> Express value probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 million dollars. <laughs>